And uh, we are honored to have our guest speaker with us, Professor Eric Moore, uh, Director of Initiative for Russian Culture and Associate Professor in the Department of History, American University of Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, Eric Moore uh, has written on history of uh, political history of Russia, on nationalism and empire, particularly at the beginning of the 20th century. His first book, Nationalizing the Russian Empire, the campaign against enemy governments during World War I, um, uh, uh, came out with Cambridge, with Harvard University Press in 2003. Uh, and, and, and there is Pirivor, and there is a translation into Russian, which is out with the new literary review uh, this year, right? The, the date of publication is uh, 2012. Uh, so keep it on your list of the market, buy it, read it, and criticize it. Uh, he published uh, with uh, Critica uh, many articles. Uh, he didn't publish it down here, but uh, we'll mend it. And uh, uh, today, um, uh, today um, uh, Eric gives a paper, which is in fact a book launch. Uh, the book in question is uh, uh, entitled Russian Citizenship from the Russian Empire to the Soviet Union. And I just learned that the proofs have been sent, and uh, the publisher is the same, Harvard University Press, and the book will be out in English uh, in, uh, September 2000, uh, in September 2012. There is a lot of conversation about migrants, citizenship, sociologists, political scientists join this conversation. Uh, and I have to say that the question of citizenship and subjecthood has not been addressed thoroughly in the historiography of the Russian Empire, or for that matter, land-based empires or continental empires. This is a truly pioneering book. It covers an important aspect. It links with the current day debates about social citizenship and about subjecthood, about spaces of belonging, about ways of definition of the political community. Uh, and it has an argument, and we are all dying to hear uh, the main argument uh, of the book. Without any further ado, I pass the floor to Professor Eric Paul. Thank you, Sasha. <clears throat> Thanks for putting up with uh, an English uh, presentation. This is my first book talk. Uh, I actually sent the proofs off yesterday, so this is, this is a, a big day for me, a big two days. Um, uh, let me tell you about uh, the topic. It is not, uh, uh, I have not defined it as uh, citizenship as equal rights and obligations under the law. Uh, that topic would be basically a history of the Soslovia system of um, rights and obligations of various social groups uh, within uh, the empire, and it would be a massive topic, and it's been written, basically it's been written in several different ways before. Uh, and the topic which is at the center of my attention would, would be only a tiny part of that larger Whole. Uh, but my topic is still pretty large, um, and it is uh, Russian subjecthood and citizenship defined as it would be in the offices of the MVD or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, and as it is defined in many histories and, and studies of citizenship in France, in Britain, the United States, and Germany. Um, uh, what it is is uh, simply uh, the uh, formal membership in the state, uh, and uh, focus throughout the book on boundaries. Two types of boundaries are central. Uh, we normally think of physical boundaries around a country as the delimiters of sovereignty of the country. Uh, but uh, sovereignty also extends to all of the country's citizens regardless of where they are, actually. Um, states can regulate entry into and exit from their citizenries in much the same way that border guards can regulate entry to, into or exit from a country. Um, in short, one can kind of imagine a citizenship boundary that exists as the interface between different citizenries in the world. And that is the boundary that I focus on in this book. Uh, and I seek to find the origins of this boundary. Uh, I ask how it was conceived, uh, how it was crossed, documented, controlled, and of course, debated. Um, the other boundary that is central to the narrative is the physical border around the country. Uh, it's an important part of the story as well. Uh, borders certainly affected flows of people into and out of the country, uh, especially in the 20th century and especially in the Soviet era. Uh, 
Uh, but in the rational case, um, especially in the, uh, before the 20th century, the site of actual control was much less along the thousands of kilometers of external border than it was in the form of documents issued in bureaucratic offices. Uh, and the inducements, sanctions, and other measures that gave certain groups incentives to either migrate or to change their citizenship status. So, uh, guard, border guards and checkpoints are, are important, but much more time in the study uh, is spent uh, with the police officials in charge of settlement policies, uh, conducting campaigns to improve passport and registration systems, uh, deciding which ethnic and religious groups should be allowed into the country, and which should be allowed, encouraged, or compelled to leave. So the main topics of the book are immigration and naturalization policies, uh, and immigration and denaturalization policies. Um, the idea for this book uh, came to me when I was researching uh, my first book, which is the story of enemy aliens during the First World War in the Russian Empire. Um, those citizens from Germany and Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, who, um, uh, civilians who ended up uh, the subject of a concerted campaign of sanctions. Um, I looked for the study of citizenship as a background and assumed it existed wasn't there, and I thought, wow, I should write this book next. And uh, so uh, it's a gaping hole in the literature. Um, and uh, I must say, it was uh, a pretty difficult book to write. And um, it began to answer research um, because of some methodolo methodological challenges. I'm going to just lay out a couple of them. Uh, one is that, that Russia is fairly unique compared to a lot of other countries in terms of legal history. And citizenship is treated most often in the literature as a legal topic. Uh, in the fundamental book, for example, on American citizenship by James Kettner, um, he begins with chapters on the 17th century legal statutes and their interpretations in Britain. And it's quite self-evident that this is relevant to understanding contemporary American citizenship because of the continuous legal tradition through the centuries. Um, of course, in the Russian, you have, a, you have a problem of 1917 in the Russian case where Soviet Union self-consciously uh, overturned and discarded uh, uh, the entire inherited uh, legal tradition. So one can't just uncover and unearth uh, a, a legal history of citizenship. Um, one needs a different approach, and uh, that leads one to focus more on, on the practices and um, ideas behind the practices uh, without, you know, without getting overly uh, uh, focused on the concrete legal uh, categories. Um, and I found that that made it, a, a lot more time consuming and, and more difficult because one has to go into the police records and look how governors interpreted uh, decrees, uh, what they were actually doing on the ground, look at the border guards, what they're doing. Um, and uh, the, the result, I think, is uh, a, a kind of history of citizenship that probably people in countries with strong legal continuous traditions should be writing as well because it, it, it actually gets, it gets more at the real practices. That said, it's almost impossible to get at the actual practices of citizenship uh, because everything that appears in the archives is an exception by rule. And um, trying to figure out what the central narrative is in a sea of exceptions is, is a pretty difficult challenge. And uh, I think I lost some, uh, some hair in doing this. Um, so uh, the, the story is very complex, and um, there are multiple arguments that emerge out of it. So I'm sorry to disappoint you, Sasha, but I, I don't have, unlike in my first book, I don't have one single core argument that I keep returning to, but rather there's a cluster of them that appear. Um, let me just list a few of them. Um, one is that Russian citizenship history, uh, by the way, the, the focus of the book is on the era from 1860 to 1930. So it begins with the Great Reforms, with what I call a forgotten great reform of naturalization uh, and immigration policy, and it ends with Stalin slamming the door shut um, uh, to the world. Uh, that's the sort of focus of the uh, book, but the introductory chapter goes way back deep into Russian history to sort of prepare the way for uh, 1860, and then the last chapter races through the 20th century and just, uh, has a few words about the contemporary situation and how it relates to uh, the uh, history. Um, so the first, um, the, the first uh, general point in the book uh, is that Russian citizenship history in the era from 1860 to 1914 is much more comparable to and evolved in a much closer interaction with citizenship in other countries. 
Uh, the most distinctive aspect of this period is the persistence of what I call the attract and hold model of Russian population policy and citizenship policy as well. That is uh, an attempt to draw immigration and to promote naturalization uh, on the one hand and to prevent immigration and denaturalization on the other hand. Uh, this model was present in most European countries uh, from early modern times, but it persisted in the Russian Empire longer than in most other places. Uh, and uh, one of the puzzles I try to work through in the book is to try to explain why it is that this this approach uh, persisted for so long, uh, even when you get to the end of the 19th century, and Russia, in many, in many ways, faces an overpopulation crisis. And, uh, and many people agree that immigration would have been a, a good safety valve in the same way it was in so many other countries. And yet, there was a persistent uh, uh, tenacity of this attract and hold uh, policy, uh, this negative approach to immigration. Um, uh, the second general point is that citizenship policies from 1860 to 1914 were fundamentally driven by a strategy of modernization and the attempt to draw foreign investors, skilled workers, and unskilled workers for industry and agriculture. The link between economic policy, modernization policy, and citizenship policy is enormously strong. Uh, it was explicitly in the uh, great reform language of 1860-1864 of that opened up uh, Russia and transformed its uh, naturalization policies. The, the language explicitly said that this is a strategy for drawing foreign investment participation and modernization. Um, then, uh, from 1914 to the 1920s, um, regimes moved away from globalization and the model of modernization in, in connection with globalization. Um, first, in a wartime mobilization relying on domestic sources, and then concluding in dramatic fashion in the 1920s with a near complete rejection of the model of globalizing modernization. Um, and so the sealing of the citizenship boundary by Stalin around 1930 was closely linked again to uh, the mode of industrialization that was pursued this time in uh, strong economic isolation. So those are a couple of the, uh, of the big macro arguments. Um, now let, let me give you just an overview of the uh, of the study and some of the findings of the book. So the book begins with an overview of citizenship practices in the centuries prior to 1860. Um, and I argue that Muscovy and the Russian Empire both developed a strong tradition of what I already mentioned as the attract and hold population policy. Um, the regimes went to great lengths to attract foreign merchants and mercenaries and then to create very strong systems to keep them in Russia. Later, settling the vast untilled step uh, as it was conquered uh, created a strong demand for people that led uh, Elizabeth and Catherine to uh, issue invitations uh, and to give many privileges to uh, settlers to settle the, the, the steps um, and to farm the land. Um, and as an inducement for these immigrants, uh, uh, I've come to another one of the themes of the book um, uh, that I, something I call the separate deals paradigm. Uh, where different groups were given different deals to come and settle in, in the steppe. And of course, the German colonists often were given exemptions from military service, uh, tax holidays for 10 to 20 years, um, and uh, uh, religious freedom, uh, and a, a, a whole basket of rights and obligations before the law that was different from the general. Well, there was no general, but it was different from other groups. I mean, every group had its own separate <coughs> right? Um, and so the, uh, the, the policies of immigration and naturalization always uh, worked within these separate deals. And there were always groups that came in and they negotiated a, a separate deal with the, the government. And it proved to be a very effective strategy for building the population and holding the population, too. Uh, it worked in sync with the attract and hold principle. The two of them cr created a pretty powerful engine for uh, drawing immigrants and uh, keeping them happy and so they leave. And ironically enough, it's the very idea of modern citizenship, that uh, equal rights and obligations before the law, that drove a fair number of these original immigrants out of the country. Because the, uh, the, that fundamental principle means that everyone must serve the military, and all the colonists felt that, that they would lose their exemption from military service, and it led to a large emigration. Uh, the same people who were attracted 
Um, so there's this, this one tradition of the attractive whole and the separate deals. Then there's also a deep complementary tradition of bans on immigration uh, and bans on denaturalization. It was it practically, uh, it was so difficult to denaturalize in, um, uh, and to immigrate in the uh, Russian Empire that almost all immigration uh, was uh, illegal, and we'll get to that later. Um, so, the core of the book begins with the great reforms of the 1860s. With the forgotten great reform of naturalization and immigration policy, and as I said, this, uh, this was linked to the uh, goals of industrialization and modernization, uh, the reform broke down barriers to immigration, uh, it improved the legal rights of foreigners so much that they became basically a privileged caste within Russian society. Uh, because they were made equal to um, uh, citizens, uh, Russian civic subjects, in, in terms of rights, uh, but they had the advantage of uh, no military service uh, because they were foreign subjects and diplomatic protection from abroad. Uh, naturalization was made much easier and was very strongly encouraged, but this very privileged position of foreigners uh, reduced the incentives uh, dramatically, and the result was uh, an actual uh, plummeting of naturalization rates after the inaction of this uh, to one of the lowest levels in Europe. Um, and this had implications later because the result was a large foreign subject uh, population in Russia that included substantial numbers of individuals and families who lived in Russia for generations uh, without naturalizing. So Russia actually had a fairly large foreign subject population relative to its population compared to other countries. Um, now, the, this privileged position of foreigners did not go unnoticed. It drew uh, popular opposition already in the 1860s. Uh, various economic nationalist uh, publicists, Slavophiles, and conservatives uh, criticized the foreign role right up to 1914. Uh, but the regime, for the most part, stood firm in support of its uh, globalizing uh, modernization strategy and continued to support the foreign role in the economy and the, uh, the, the entire basket of reforms that came in the 1860s. Uh, the link between um, uh, uh, modernization and intensified the interaction with the outside world, uh, became key to most aspects of Russian citizenship um, policy for the next half century. Uh, we can see this period um, as the first era of Russian globalization, uh, currently living through the second. In just a couple decades, border crossings changed from rare uh, group events to normal daily individual occurrences on a mass scale. Here's a few figures. In the 1850s, there were roughly 40,000 total registered border crossings by foreigners and Russian subjects combined. By the mid-1860s, uh, about 100,000. Uh, by 1900, 4 million. And by 1909, in that year, more than 10 million uh, border crossings. So it's a, it's a real exponential uh, chart in terms of the intensity of action and uh, movement across the, uh, the borders of the empire. Now, the era of the counter-reforms in the 1880s saw some serious challenges to the great reforms of citizenship, and the most significant of these began with a unilateral German action that, that's widely considered to be one of the most uh, important events in the history of citizenship in the late 19th century. In 1885, Germany suddenly uh, began a mass expulsion of 30,000 Russian subjects. Most of them were uh, Polish and Jewish uh, temporary workers, um, uh, both in agriculture and in industry. Uh, from uh, the Germany to the Russian Empire. The reasons were almost entirely domestic. This was uh, Bismarck whipping up anti-Polish sentiment for electoral purposes, uh, and they came in the context of his attempts to limit Polish land ownership in Prussia. Um, the uh, actions actually did not run technically counter to international law, because international law explicitly gives the right to states to expel foreigners. And at first, Russian officials didn't see it as much of a scandal, but it, it quite quickly grew into a huge dispute. Uh, Bismarck basically stopped the importation of all uh, Gastarbeiter uh, guest workers from um, uh, Russia for the next five years. Russia responded. There was a real interaction between the German action and Russian actions in the citizenship front. Russia responded with decrees that limited the ability of foreign citizens, foreign subjects and citizens, to purchase or inherit lands in the western borderlands. And this was directed uh, against Poles, uh, 
but also against uh, Germans coming from these regions. Uh, that was one reaction. And in 1887, the decree effectively cut off German immigration to rural areas in the western borderlands. Um, but um, the uh, end result of the conflict uh, actually uh, was uh, quite different from what I think was more expected. Um, in the five years where Germany did not have guest workers, basically, um, the pressures in Germany to uh, end the ban on imported cheap labor uh, got very intense. Uh, Junkers and factory owners throughout Germany suffered from a lack of cheap labor. Uh, when Bismarck was replaced in 1890, Germany introduced an entirely new system of border controls, including a new system of passport, uh, much, much tighter documentation of border crossing, uh, and created the first, the world's first modern uh, guest worker system. Um, uh, it imposed an, uh, a, a really remarkable set of safeguards against the permanent settlement and naturalization of these uh, guest workers. Uh, only unmarried workers could participate, and for up to a maximum of three years. They could only work and stay in the country from April 1st to November 15th. Uh, German officials allowed foreign seasonal, uh, seasonal labor migration within the, rem within the, the bounds of this, uh, this new tight, tightly controlled system to expand rapidly. Uh, from 25,000 in 1894 to half a million in 1905 and almost a million in 1914. So the law, in a way, facilitated an even greater expansion of seasonal migration to Germany. Uh, interestingly, at the exact same time, the late 1880s, while Germany was constructing this system, uh, Russia set up its own parallel system, almost identical in, in many ways, uh, in its own Far East, uh, where it created an, an entire, entirely new, tightly documented uh, uh, system of uh, seasonal labor uh, uh, migration control um, in uh, the Far East for Chinese and Korean workers. Um, and uh, this too allowed guest worker flows to increase, but used citizenship as a means to prevent permanent settlement of these guest workers. And it and allowed uh, citizenship to be used as a tool for population policy as well as uh, the importation of labor. So it, it, it was kind of the best of both worlds in the bureaucrat's mind. You get you get your modernization and cheap labor, and you don't get the demographic, uh, the unwanted demographic effects. Uh, and I think this example is one of many in, in my book that shows, um, uh, or one of several anyway, that, that shows the interactive nature of citizenship policies. Often the origins of domestic Russian policies come from abroad. And in, in this case here, the, the, the first domino that fell was the unilateral German action, and then a series of reactions uh, uh, led to a whole change in. Russian citizenship policy in several spheres, uh, and not just on the western border, but all the way off in the, in the, in the Far East. Um, so uh, now let me say a few things about emigration. Um, Russia had a deep history of treating emigration as an illegal act, uh, something grounded in the legal principle that serfs and nobles who left were guilty of the crime of uh, desertion. In international uh, usage, uh, the passport is generally a document that verifies identity and declares to foreign governments that the bearer of the passport has the support of his government and requests permission for him to pass through the port or the border. Right? Um, in Russia, the passport, of course, was very different and reflects how difficult it was for a Russian subject to travel abroad. From 1649 uh, uh, on, it uh, required a Zagran passport, a Zagranichi passport. It was valid for only one trip abroad. Uh, and the Russian internal passport uh, had even less in common which, what, with what we think of as a passport today. It was a document issued to uh, peasants and lower classes that defined a circumscribed area of their residence beyond which they were banned from traveling. Neither passport served to facilitate travel or verify identity, but rather the opposite, to limit movement. Um, uh, travel was difficult. Um, and, and legal emigration was even more difficult, almost impossible, until the Great Reforms. Um, and in fact, uh, the official numbers of immigrants uh, are almost, uh, almost non-existent uh, up until 1860, with the exception of the occasional large mass immigration, like, for example, the Crimean Tatars or, or some groups in the Caucasus who left en masse, um, uh, generally after annexations, but in some other instances as well. But, as a yearly individual uh, sort of phenomenon, 
uh, immigration didn't really exist until 1860. But then it really took off very rapidly. And in that era, in the era between 1860 and 1914, uh, there was a net emigration of 4.5 million um, uh, people from the Russian Empire. Now, immigration was an important part of the story of modernization in most European countries. It was an important release valve for the pressures of overpopulation in the countryside, and uh, especially in times of unemployment, also from the cities. Uh, it also had benefits. It brought, brought back revenues in the form of earnings sent by young men to their families. Um, and scholars of immigration have found that many more immigrants uh, returned to their native lands and did so more often than we used to think. Um, and they've also found that international networks created by immigrants uh, and return migrants were extremely important as a source of economic innovation and modernization. Uh, and a, a great facilitator of capital flows internationally. So, uh, emigration and a free immigration policy, one that allows returns and allows movement, can be a real asset to modernization. Uh, we know that now uh, uh, it wasn't as clear to people at the time. Um, and all of this could have been true for Russia in the late 19th century, but although there were efforts to facilitate temporary and permanent immigration, Official policies remain stubbornly opposed. Uh, the deep tradition of holding subjects in the country and in Russian subjects that persisted basically all the way up to 1917. And one of the biggest explanations for this persistence of the negative attitude towards immigration and um, denaturalization comes from late imperial population policy. And this, for this, uh, let me just point out one of the most remarkable aspects of the immigration um, during this entire era. Uh, in this entire period, only one to four percent of all immigrants were ethnic Russians, depending on how you count ethnic Russian. Um, it means Orthodox. And, uh, well, then it would be more like four percent. That then it was, yeah, if you include Ukrainians and um, um, and Belarus. Uh, but as low as 1%. You know. And of, of the ethnic Russian uh, groups leaving, many were, there were Sekhnazi and uh, other minority groups. So really, uh, it was almost a non existent phenomenon uh, of, of just regular ethnic Russian migrants. Um, if you look at the, for example, uh, the population of uh, people who came from the Russian Empire in the United States in 1910, there were 1.7 million of them, and only 40,000 were ethnic Russians. Um, emigration was just about entirely a phenomenon of non-Russian minorities leaving the empire. Um, so if you consider this on a per capita basis, the imbalance is really quite astounding. Uh, Jews were 184 times more likely to emigrate than Russians, uh, Germans 55 times more likely, and Poles 57 times more likely. Those were the three groups that made up the great majority of all immigrants uh, from uh, the Russian Empire. Um, now, German, Lithuanian, Finnish, and Polish immigrants from the Russian Empire were all predominantly agrarian and tended to emigrate to parts of the world where land was freely available. Uh, so the puzzle then is why didn't Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians from the Russian Empire emigrate in number of numbers at all comparable to them. Uh, after all, land uh, shortage was a huge problem already in the late uh, 19th century. Um, and uh, I've worked through in my book a, a, a series of possible explanations, and it seems to me that the best answer lies in the inheritance and land tenure systems. Uh, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians almost entirely practiced communal agriculture with part of the inheritance. Um, and in systems of primogeniture, it, it's studies of immigrant populations find that it's almost all second and third and fourth sons, not the first son who inherits the farm, who emigrates uh, to, uh, 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 in, in search of land. So lacking this uh, engine, this, this push factor of uh, the, the out-of-luck second and third sons, um, the uh, uh, emigration didn't, didn't occur. There may be other explanations, but that seems to be the, the, the best one um, that, that I can come up with. And of course, this is hugely important in explaining the agrarian crisis. In the Habsburg monarchy, uh, the uh, safety valve of millions and millions of, of peasants leaving the countryside at least somewhat alleviated the land 
uh, in the Russian Empire, there was no such uh, safety valve. Um, nonetheless, the barriers to legal uh, immigration, whether this is true or not, the barriers to legal immigration remain substantial right up to 1914. Just a few examples. There are a legion of uh, administrative uh, hurdles to, to cross. Uh, but one of the big things is just a simple cost. In 1910, uh, the Granichi passport cost 17 rubles. Uh, that's equivalent to uh, roughly a month uh, uh, of earnings by a Russian farm laborer. Um, there was a requirement that the applicant receive a document from the re regional gendarme administration indicating a lack of travel, uh, a lack of objection to travel abroad. Uh, another one verifying that he had no outstand outstanding debts or taxes. Um, and uh, the entire process required stamps and travel to offices and provincial capitals, time spent waiting at each step in the process. And altogether, it could take up to three months at an expense of 30 to 40 rubles um, for uh, someone planning to emigrate uh, and go abroad uh, legally. Um, uh, in addition, if the potential emigrant wanted to formally denaturalize or if they were required to do so by Russian law, then there were substantial additional fees in Credit hurdles, which could end up making the whole process cost up to 100 rubles. This was clearly out, out beyond the, the, the means of most uh, Russian immigrants. Um, and the result is almost no one did it in the legal way. Uh, just, just by contrast, just to give, give some sense of the comparison here, um, uh, Russia was really, really uh, out of line compared to other countries uh, in terms of the expense and, and difficulties. In Italy, a document was issued within 24 hours, in Spain within three days, uh, and uh, a passport was given free of charge. Um, uh, in England, the uh, foreign passport cost the equivalent of one ruble, uh, and in Germany about three rubles. So uh, Russia is really different from every, every other place. And the result is that everyone left uh, illegally. Um, uh, estimates, internal estimates by studies that the MPD did uh, of the practice um, uh, generally cluster around 80% of all immigrants were probably <coughs> not registered uh, without foreign passports and just in um, through immigrant uh, 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 smuggling rooms. These immigrant smuggling rooms, by the way, were extraordinarily efficient, and they actually had published uh, price lists which included different levels of luxury and different <laughs> different different services that would be provided, um, showing how, how sophisticated this operation uh, became. So why did Russian policy remain so opposed to emigration uh, for so long? Well, in the chapter I go through a fairly long list of reasons, and uh, I think I'll focus on what I think the most important uh, and most interesting one is, and that is uh, the, the link between emigration policies and uh, population politics. Um, the first thing is that immigration actually was basically allowed and legalized for some groups. Uh, and the most important, of course, is for uh, Jews. In May of 1892, the Jewish Colonization Association was allowed to open branches throughout the country and to provide information and assistance to uh, Jewish immigrants. Uh, by 1910, it had 400 offices, spread news about immigration, it gave assistance in purchasing tickets, it arranged cheap lodging en route, it helped, it helped Jews to plan for life in their new country. Um, those uh, immigrants leaving through the offices of the uh, uh, Jewish Colonization Association did not have to pay for passport fees, uh, and the organization took care of all of the complex and time-consuming paperwork. Uh, the state even provided a discounted uh, train fare to the border. Um, now, uh, the policy uh, facilitating Jewish immigration it was a, an asterisk and a fairly large one. That is uh, that, uh, at least technically, everyone who departed through the uh, offices of the, of the uh, Colonization Association um, uh, was placed on a list of individuals eternally banned from returning to the Russian Empire. Uh, and that suggests that lurking behind the opening of the door uh, to Jewish immigration was population policy. Uh, the idea was that when these Jews leave, they can never come back. And um, uh, in addition to being placed on these lists, governors typically added a line to the exit documents that were given to these individuals 
uh, that the, um, the individuals were considered to have left Russia forever. But this practice, by the way, is, is uh, highly unusual in a comparative context, uh, but not unusual in Russian citizenship practices. Um, uh, as far as I can tell, it was first used in the Caucasus and the Crimea already in the 18th century, uh, and uh, in the mass departures after the annexation of Crimea, uh, those who did have documents uh, uh, leaving um, uh, had a similar notation on those documents, and declarations were issued to those leaving, saying, if you leave, you're welcome to leave, but you can never come back. Um, and uh, so this it was also typically in the late 19th century, not only applied to Jews, but also to departing German colonists, uh, Certainly, the Duke of Wars, when they left in the mass, the famous uh, mass exit, um, exodus that uh, Tolstoy wrote about, um, and, and groups from the Caucasus right up to 1914. And th that practice itself suggests that there was a kind of population policy uh, mentality going on among those who were running, um, uh, who were insisting on this, this aspect of it. Um, so that's that's one thing the, uh, the the legalization the partial legalization of uh, Jewish immigration. Um, there were also, um, but there were a long list of reasons to reform immigration policy to make it more affordable and less of an administrative um, nightmare. Uh, the young Russian shipping industry had a particular interest in legalization, uh, and it led a campaign that resulted in an interdepartmental committee to drop reform ideas, uh, and uh, in, in internal discussions surrounding uh, the committees revealed that the most persuasive argument against the change, um, uh, within these committees, the most persuasive argument was that Slavic immigration, uh, which was almost non-existent, as I, I mentioned before, uh, was beginning. And Russian nationalists in the press, uh, the agencies in charge of settling Siberia, uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and its various branches, uh, they all were very alarmed by this. Any sign that Slavic immigration might be beginning was for them, for all of these various reasons, dealing with internal settlement policies, with, with um, the struggles between nationalities in the western borderlands, uh, with the tense issues in, in the Russian Far East, where the threat of the yellow flood and the yellow invasion uh, was always on the minds of, of people. All of these things combined to convince these officials that immigration should not be freed up. It should remain hard, it should remain difficult, and it remain basically um, impossible to do legally. Uh, and so despite all kinds of conversations, uh, bills that were written up, uh, interdepartment committees wrote large memos to legalize immigration. Uh, despite all of these uh, strong arguments in favor of, of, of comprehensive immigration reform, uh, it didn't happen. So um, I was thinking about writing actually an article about this and draw the parallel to the uh, legalization, various legalization debates, because it, there's a lot of parallels to prohibition, the legalization of drugs, and, and everything. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the practice didn't make sense, but still people were not willing to, to, to uh, legalize. Um, the, uh, so that's probably the most important uh, reason for not uh, uh, legalizing, probably, is this, this fear that it would unleash a flood of Slavic immigration. Um, when we turn to denaturalization policy, um, the regime also held very strongly to the principle of permanent allegiance. Permanent allegiance is, it was a universal principle in most uh, uh, early modern uh, kingdoms uh, and uh, of all the states, oddly enough, the one that uh, left it uh, latest in the 19th century was Great Britain, which I'll let us go through for various reasons until 1870. Uh, but uh, Russia continued to hold on to this principle, um, and that is uh, denying recognition of the denaturalization of its former subjects uh, all the way up to 1917. The reason, as far as we can tell, uh, uh, is, uh, traces back to a very specific dispute uh, with the United States. And it was over the issue of Jews from the Russian Empire who went to the United States, naturalized as American citizens, and then traveled back to Russia and tried to do things like open factories and do all the things that foreigners are 
foreigners had as many rights as anyone, especially after 1860. But the Czarist officials said, no, wait a minute, you're a former Russian subject. Uh, so you're subject to all the restrictions that all Jews in the Russian Empire are, are subject to. You cannot open a factory, you, you cannot move outside the pale, you cannot. And, and there were diplomatic disputes over this in, already in the 1860s that emerged. And um, uh, it, w it became very quickly uh, the most important issue in US Russian relations. Uh, and it culminated in a series of disputes over the decades, culminated in the abrogation of the uh, commercial treaty. Uh, of 1832, I believe, in um, 1911, when uh, the, the U.S. was kind of an early Jackson Bank. Um, the U.S. Uh, uh, refused to renew the commercial treaty, saying that only when uh, uh, Russia recognizes the, the naturalizations that the United States has conducted will, uh, will we have normal, normal full uh, trade relations with Russia. Uh, but the the unwillingness to uh, uh, allow Jews to escape the restrictions on, uh, their, basically to, to, to refuse to allow them to, to escape the, uh, their non-citizen status within the Russian Empire uh, led to the preservation of this principle of, um, uh, of permanent allegiance and it affected denaturalization policy more generally. Uh, Russian officials tried to argue to the United States and to other countries that no, no, it's not particularly um, uh, a policy directed against Jews because we don't recognize the right to denaturalize of any of our subjects. Um, and that became a, um, uh, a huge issue. There's a lot more about denaturalization in the book. I'm not going to say much more about it uh, today. Uh, it gets pretty technical and frankly it's not nearly as important as the immigration uh, policies uh, are. Uh, but if, if you have some questions about denaturalization and naturalization uh, history and, and law, you can either wait for the book or we can talk about it um, uh, in a few minutes. Um, so uh, let me just turn to you now uh, the, the 20th century. Uh, by the turn of the century, the future seemed to lie with the forces pushing toward a, re a liberalization of Russian subject subjective policies. The counter-reforms had rolled back some of the reforms in the 1860s, but Russia's historic industrialization drive was in full swing, um, and uh, it included a, a, a policy of integration in the global economy and an open door to foreign labor, investment, and talent. Uh, uh, steam and rail travel facilitated unprecedented globalization of international economic activity. Uh, the Russian Empire was a full participant in all of this. Uh, rapidly expanding seasonal labor migration was bringing back significant sums and repatriated earnings. And uh, new Russian steamship companies were leading a push to legalize immigration and gain a bigger share of the proceeds. Uh, outside the government, uh, a vibrant liberal political movement was emerging and its ideas centered on creating modern citizenship based on equal rights and obligations for each individual member of the state. Uh, and within the government, the 1890s laws on residence permits and Jewish immigration moved in a relatively liberal direction. Even within the Department of the Police, committees were uh, at work trying out deeper reforms. Immigration reform proposals were fully worked out, and there's no reason to think that eventually, eventually they would probably have been implemented. But the story, of course, took an unexpected turn in 1914 with the outbreak of World War I. This is a story I tell in full. 250 page detail in my uh, first book, uh, but just a few highlights. Um, so, when the war breaks out, from the great reforms to World War I, there had been a net immigration of approximately 2 million individuals uh, from Russia's three main adversaries during the war. Uh, about half of all immigration, net immigration during this period, came from Russia's enemies. Uh, many naturalized, but as, I, but as I said before, there were a lot of incentive, incentives not to naturalize, and so many uh, had not. Uh, and many were foreign subjects who lived uh, and flourished in Russia with rights equal to Russian subjects um, uh, under the law. At the beginning of the war, there were over a million permanent resident foreigners in Russia, about 600,000 of them were from an enemy countries. Um, uh, nearly half of all gross uh, domestic capital investments uh, in the last three decades of the old regime came from foreigners, and the foreign role in all spheres of the industrial economy was very large. Um, now, citizenship policies in the era from 1860 to 1914 had a lot to do with the successes of globalizing rapid industrialization. 
Uh, the war suddenly pushed the government to undo much of this progress and to reverse many citizenship policies. Uh, first, so the government interned about 300,000 enemy subjects of the duration of the war. Uh, second, uh, it pursued a uh, campaign of expropriation of industrial, commercial, and uh, agrarian properties. Uh, third, it uh, denied access to the courts to enemy citizens, uh, and this was an action that directly reversed the great reform principle that foreigners have equal rights before the law, um, uh, equal rights to Russian citizens. Um, uh, and uh, finally, it, it, the Russian uh, uh, leadership imposed a ban on all naturalization. They did this for pragmatic reasons to stop foreigners from naturalizing to avoid all the other sanctions that they were imposing on them. Uh, but it was a historic step, and it applied not only to enemy subjects, but to, um, uh, to all foreigners during the war. Uh, and um, uh, Russia would never really go back to the kind of open and aggressive pursuit of naturalization that had been the case for centuries prior to 1914. Uh, so by 1917, under the pressures of war, the old regime had moved radically and rapidly to undermine a half century of citizenship policy. Uh, ostensibly temporary security measures like the internment of enemy subjects were turned into uh, more decisive and permanent measures as they became entwined with policies to liquidate uh, their businesses and land holdings. The campaign against enemy subjects went beyond its original boundaries, targeting naturalized immigrants from the enemy countries uh, as well. Uh, it also resulted in some new regulations and laws that affected all foreigners. The war brought a sharp break from the era of internationalization, bringing bans on denaturalization and naturalization, uh, along with uh, extremely sharp constraints on emigration and immigration. Uh, in short, after a half a century of internationalization, Russia veered towards isolationism. Now, the February, February Revolution then comes and brings the historic decree on the abolition of restrictions based on religion and nationality. This essentially declares full citizenship um, from above, uh, suddenly just full citizenship, uh, defined as equal rights and obligations before the law. Um, uh, it brought the immediate abolition of all restrictions in currently existing laws and regulations on the rights of Russian uh, citizens on the basis of their religion or nationality. But it did not reverse the sanctions that had been imposed during World War I on foreigners. The ban on naturalization and the general shift of the war away from the citizenship policies of the previous decades. Then the Bolsheviks come to power, and they never really demobilize from the changes that had come in citizenship policy in uh, World War I, and instead in many ways move to extend new restrictions on uh, emigration and immigration. Now, ostensibly, the Bolsheviks began their rule with an open invitation to the workers of the world to immigrate to the Soviet Union and to naturalize, if they so wished. Uh, they also became the first country to give women their own choice of citizenship, rather than always automatically following the choice of their husbands. Truly a groundbreaking uh, decree. Uh, these policies, however, were much more a matter of theory than practice. During the Civil War era, uh, you can imagine who would want to immigrate to a civil war um, uh, with famine and uh, war, hyperinflation, unemployment, and, and total uh, economic disarray. Uh, there was very little reason for workers or peasants to migrate to the, uh, uh, to the Soviet republics, and very few did. Uh, then in the 1920s, despite fairly aggressive efforts to recruit immigrants in the 1920s during the new economic policy, the results were meager. They were meager mainly probably because of low wages and consistently, uh, but also because of consistently strong opposition to immigration from the security branches, from the OGPU and from the NKVD. Uh, between, for example, 1922 and 1925, um, the uh, organization that was set up to recruit foreign labor uh, from abroad claimed that it received 420,000 requests for permission to immigrate and it only granted 11,000. And it only granted 11,000 primarily because the economic ministries kept saying, we don't have full employment yet, so just wait. We'll think about immigration later. Um, and the OGPU said, well, if we're going to have immigrants, we need to check, do full background checks on each and every one in case there are spies amongst them. And so the combined opposition of these other ministries basically sank the uh, 
the idea of a large scale working class immigration. And the spies being the whites. Right, right. Well, I'll get to that in a second. The, 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 there's, there's a whole story about that, too, about return to migration. Um, so, uh, immigration basically, uh, in principle, was there, but in practice was not. The regime also pushed against many of the traditional protections granted to foreigners under international law. Uh, the uh, new civil code gave, gave each republic broad powers to limit the civil capacity of foreigners in terms of travel, choice of profession, acquisition of property, and in business activities. Uh, the regime also made it an explicit policy to restrict the rights of certain foreigners in retaliation for the actions of other states. Um, now, the, the chapter, I have one large chapter on the Soviet, the early Soviet era from 1917 to 19, roughly around 1930, um, and it includes a large section on uh, the complex negotiations dealing with what we're doing is the optation treaties, optatsia, which dealt with uh, the new states, uh, Poland, Lithuania, etc. Uh, and there were a large number of millions of uh, Poles, Lithuanians, and others, refugees from the Great War, who were on RSFSR territory. And there were a series of agreements, negotiated treaties between these new states and the RSFSR that um, had deadlines for these individuals to return. Uh, and uh, uh, the process of implementing these, these deadlines is, is quite interesting. I mean, on the one hand, optation, this, this is the heyday of optation on a global scale. It, it also occurred uh, in, the, the, in, in many areas of, of uh, Eastern Europe, along with the plebiscites that determined boundaries. Um, there was an unprecedented attempt to um, uh, deploy this new principle that states should uh, be coterminous with the national groupings that make up the state. And in some sense, the Soviet Union was part of this process through these adaptation treaties. But if you really look at the details of how they are implemented, it's really quite striking how, um, uh, how negative uh, the, uh, the policies were. Uh, often the deadlines were published only a few months before they had to be fulfilled. Um, the OGPU insisted and the Ministry of Finance insisted that uh, there be strict limits on the amount of property and monetary wealth that could be taken out of the country by those opt-ins who chose to move to, their, to the countries. And in practice, it seems that they basically, other than a small amount that was necessary just to make the trip, basically everything was confiscated. Um, so it was an enormously difficult decision that these people had to make within often two, three months to go ahead. And plus, above all that, they had to sign the old czarist sort of uh, uh, so the, uh, line was added that once the decision is made, it's basically for every camp. And so uh, it was a, a it was a very uh, very difficult uh, practice and and something that um, uh, affected millions of lives. Um, the even more stark was uh, uh, the uh, process of what I call the, the uh, Great Denaturalization. Uh, this was a series of deadlines from 1921 to 1923, which required all former citizens of the Russian Empire to formally accept Soviet citizenship by a, a certain deadline, or automatically be denaturalized. Of course, not many immigrants were willing to apply for Soviet citizenship, and uh, those who did by no means received an automatic acceptance. Um, officials abroad and at the border were instructed to be vigilant against allowing the naturalization and return of class enemies, former white officers in particular, but, but basically anyone from the wrong class, and any individuals who were in any way suspected of potential disloyalty. So the decree basically amounted to a mass denaturalization of the vast majority of the population of former subjects of the Russian Empire residing outside of the empire. Overnight it created Passport 
which allowed these stateless individuals uh, the ability to travel, even though they didn't have formal citizenship but in a state, it was an alternative to that. Um, so, taking a long view, the great denaturalization was in some ways grounded in the traditions of Russian practice. Uh, from the 18th to the 20th century, the regime had granted exceptions to the general ban on immigration by requiring that groups choosing to leave be banned forever from returning to the empire. And often this was accompanied by denaturalization. Uh, but this type of immigration with denaturalization had always been decreed on a case-by-case -case basis, never as a general policy toward all immigrants at, at a given moment. Um, So perhaps the biggest break with prior immigration policy was the denaturalization and de facto recognition of the immigration of millions of ethnic Russians. As I was saying before, the regime went to great lengths to prevent the emigration of uh, uh, the emigration of ethnic Russians and their denaturalization. Uh, so this was a huge break with, um, uh, with decades of practice. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, the old regime had actually gone to great lengths uh, to promote the return migration of perceived core groups whenever possible. For example, old believer groups that had been repressed in, in earlier centuries and it had gone to Bulgaria were wooed back by the late imperial Russian regime with subsidies and free uh, railway tickets to go and settle give free land out in Siberia because the Siberian governor general was so desperate to get any kind of Russian out into Siberia. Um, and so this this is a this is a big um, big change. In a few in the, in the course of just a few years, roughly 15 times more ethnic Russians left the country than during the entire history of Russia prior to 1914. And the Soviet response was to make this mass immigration permanent through denaturalization and confiscation of property. Um, so there are some continuities from old regime to new regime, but there are also some incredible discontinuities, and this is one of them. Um, the great denaturalization also took an important step toward the economic and social isolation that became a defining feature of the Soviet Union. Um, ethnic diasporas can be powerful sources of cross-border communication, investment, income, and exchange. Uh, and in the early 1920s, the Soviet Union decisively broke ties with its large diaspora, making travel and eventually even communication between the diaspora and the Soviet population extremely difficult, if not impossible. So, in some sense, it's kind of anticlimactic uh, what happens in the late uh, 1920s when Stalin makes his decisive turn towards autarky. Uh, 1914 took one huge step in that direction, and the early Soviets' uh, examples that I've shown already also took large steps in that direction. But still, everything Stalin did in the late 20s was dramatic, and so was his slamming of the citizenship door. Um, so, I argue in, in this chapter that a big part of the citizenship policy was a direct result of the choice of uh, the model of economic development, uh, economic isolationism, and the model of industrializing with full reliance on domestic sources. Uh, the mobilization against the outside world during the war scare of 1926-27 got things underway. Uh, it was a campaign against foreign concessions. Uh, the, centerpiece of the 1920s policy of engaging with the outside world and trying to uh, bring foreign investment and, and, and involvement in modernization. Um, uh, foreign concessions were all basically uh, shut down by the end of the 1920s, uh, by 1930. Uh, and there was a drive to then seal the border to prevent immigration uh, and also, just as importantly, uh, to prevent any kind of foreign exchange from leaving any kind of currency from leaving, any kind of precious metals from leaving the country. Um, uh, one of the most frequent uh, reasons for greater restrictions that I saw when I was looking through the details uh, in the uh, mainly in the NKPD uh, files um, at this time was interventions by the uh, Ministry of Finance saying, make sure you are extremely strict on all border crossings because we've heard that people are are, are slipping out with gold, and slipping out with precious metals. I'll stop by the way. Right, right, no, very much. And, and so the, uh, uh, so the Ministry of Finance, oddly enough, is, is one of the forces for economic 
uh, isolation and for closing, uh, really shutting down the border. Um, a series of rules were decreed in 1928 uh, that tightened restrictions on small traders almost to, uh, uh, to, to such an extreme extent that it basically shut down all border trade. Um, uh, traders were only allowed to bring uh, enough uh, items for their own personal use and no more. So the foreign trade was uh, basically shut down. So the 1930s in many ways brought the citizenship story full circle, back to the era before the great reforms. Um, but at closer inspection, it actually went further, to a degree of closure never seen before in Russian history. Foreigners could only enter the country under extremely limited circumstances. The absolute number of foreigners in Soviet territory plummeted to less than one-tenth of the level in the late imperial period. Uh, they enjoyed better wages than Soviet citizens, but they rarely had more legal protections. And in fact, in the 1930s, and especially during the purges, foreigners fell under greater suspicion than most. Uh, one even gets the impression that the Soviet Union was working towards some ideal endpoint of having no foreigners in the country at all in the 1930s. And that the few allowed uh, were there as a result of a distasteful but temporary compromise to get their expertise and then send them home. Immigration was almost completely banned for Soviet citizens, and for the first time in Russian history, this ban was actually enforced. The, the, the border was sealed as never before. The lively cross-border movements and trade that had been an important part of imperial uh, life, Russian imperial life for centuries, came to an end. Under the old regime, residents of border regions could get inexpensive uh, multi-exit and multi-entry documents called the, the, the legitimation tickets. Uh, they could cross the border frequently to trade. Uh, by the 1930s, traders could only take tiny, tiny personal use exemptions. Moreover, an entire regime of border zones was erected to prevent illegal crossings, contraband, and smuggling of immigrants and immigrants, and normal small-scale trading. An intense campaign to prevent any kind of valuta, valuta export further raised the stakes for all the branches of the government. Uh, the great denaturalization of 1921 was strictly upheld. No former subject of the Russian Empire or citizen of the Soviet Union who had lost the citizenship could enter the country until he or she acquired Soviet citizenship abroad. In case after case, regarding people who had a chance, who had had the chance to opt for other citizenships but had not done so by the established deadline, uh, the government upheld their ascribed status as Soviet citizens even if they have no documents and have not undergone any kind of formal ceremony, and um, even if a, another state claimed them to be eligible for their, their citizenship. The files in the late 20s are, are full of uh, Lithuanians and Siberia saying, oh, I made a mistake, I should have applied, I didn't know the deadline, blah, blah, blah. And invariably, these were denied. And often, interestingly, the um, OGPU would overrule the NKVD. So the NKVD would approve of, say, oh, sure, you can, you can go to Lithuania, and OGPU would say no. Be returned, and the NKVD would say, "Sorry, the OGP said no." Um, and the OGP was the final authority on all matters of uh, naturalization, immigration, immigration, denaturalization. Um, so that says a lot too. <laughs> right. Um, so um, the uh, only after um, so uh, let's see. So the closure of the citizenship boundary cannot be char characterized as a return to Russian traditions. Uh, I argue it was much more the fruit of trends that began during World War I and deepened right from the start of the Bolshevik Revolution. The victory of the autarkic model was not inevitable, but once it was chosen, it became a defining feature of the Soviet Union. So I just have a, a concluding uh, section that I would like to read from my conclusion uh, of the book. Um, just to sum up. So study of the citizenship boundary shed, sheds light upon the population policies of the imperial and Soviet regimes. Citizenship and migration policies directly influence the shape of the population and the mix of the subgroups of that population by controlling or at least influencing who entered, uh, who left, who stayed, who naturalized or denaturalized and left forever. Based on the assumption that wealth derives from population and that Russia desperately needed more people, technology, and trade in order to modernize, the Tsars developed a long tradition of going to great lengths to attract and hold people in the state. This tradition ran deeper and lasted longer than in most countries, 
and it continued well into the age of nationalism and rural overpopulation toward the end of the imperial era. However, the old regime also used citizenship policies like a filter to affect the ethnic balance of the population. Jews were banned from immigration or naturalization, and official policies left them much more free to leave than any other population, while several Muslim populations were banned from returning if they chose to emigrate. In contrast to Austria-Hungary and Germany, which dealt with rural overpopulation by facilitating mass overseas emigration of their core populations, Russia strove to hold, hold its Slavic populations in the country, maintaining an increasingly anachronistic set of uh, restrictions on emigration up right to the very end. Conversely, it quasi-legalized emigration by Jews and other minority groups and imposed policies on naturalization and denaturalization that made it difficult for them to return or maintain connections with their compatriots in the empire. The statistics are stunning. Ethnic Russians comprising roughly half the population of the empire accounted for roughly 2% of all emigration prior to 1914, while Jews accounting for less than 5% of the imperial population accounted for more than 40% of the immigrants in the same period. The role of ethnic population politics in citizenship and migration policy came to a sudden and dramatic end with the provisional government's decree in March 1917, abolishing all restrictions and discrimination on the basis of ethnicity or religion. The Soviet regime, if anything, reversed the values of the old regime's ethnic population politics by conducting a mass denaturalization that targeted hundreds of thousands of ethnic Russians while welcoming Jewish and German return migration. But in different ways, the Soviet regime pushed population politics via citizenship policy to new extremes, this time using criteria of class rather than ethnicity. It banned immigration and naturalization for the middle and upper classes, allowing it only for members of the working class. Early Soviet practices created a denizen category of people who were deprived of the rights of citizenship, the licensi, while the great denaturalization of former Russian subjects abroad and other policies aimed to allow or force class enemies out of the Soviet body of citizens and residents. In principle, the primary aim of citizenship policy had shifted from ethnicity to class. In practice, because of high unemployment, the general suspicion of foreigners, and the delegation of control over citizenship policies to the OGPU, the results of these policies uh, were limited from the start. The regime never allowed a free departure of class enemies uh, from within its borders, and quickly reasserted the principle that denaturalization abroad was not allowed. The old formula of tract and hold had been reduced to hold. The intensity of interaction along the citizenship boundary peaked on the eve of World War I, with over 10 million officially reported border crossings going each way, and millions more undocumented crossings. By 1930, this had been reduced to just thousands, and those few crossings were denuded of the spontaneity, the interactivity, and meaningful exchange that characterized the imperial era. Small traders faced strict limits on the amounts of goods and currency they could bring both ways, and political controls made the free exchange of ideas downright dangerous. The Soviet Union brought the most decisive break in citizenship history that any major country has ever experienced. Stalin's great break sealed the country off from the outside world, and it also sealed off Russia's earlier, historically evolved, citizenship traditions. And with that. Thank you, Eric. Uh, great presentation, uh, very dense. Uh, and uh, I have a small news to report, which testifies to the uh, relevance of the presentation. Uh, the Faculty of Anthropology of the University of St. Petersburg is opening the position of Professorship of British Control on Research and Migration. Uh, just in the mailbox, a few, a few minutes ago. Uh, so, um, uh, we had everything, and I particularly liked the, the uh, story about how to become a full Russian subject by <coughs> becoming U.S. citizen <laughs> from the Jewish part. Uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, questions and comments. Uh, the floor is uh, open now. Thank you very much for 
So in connection with that, I've been looking at some examples of transitional, of similar transitional forms, and the only example that I can find was Nansen passport, which you just mentioned. So I'm just wondering if you know of any other examples of you know similar transitional kind of identities, so to speak, introduced by international community or by other states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah or, or Nansen passport. Was just you know some except, exceptional example. You, you would think before we hammered about Russian history, but now you're all urged to be comparative. No, 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 um, and I'm, I'm planning to write an article soon, trying to do that as well. So it's um, uh, it's good, and I, I think um, I mean I'm trying to think of the parallels because there aren't actually many stateless Russians in Estonia, are there? I mean, they, well, what, what they, they are, yeah. but, but they, they have access to Russian citizenship, no? Well, they, they, yes, they do. Oh. They, yeah, they do have, but they don't want to obtain Russian citizenship. Because many of them actually prefer to remain stateless mm -hmm. as it gives them well, certain benefits within the, the space of the European Union and etc. But this is another story. Another story. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that was of the Nansen population, there was a small percent for ideological reasons who could have naturalized in France, but as a matter of principle, didn't because they expected the Soviet Union to fall at some point and wanted to remain Russian citizens. Mm -hmm. Uh, today, the uh, acceptance, uh, one thing that makes comparisons historically difficult <coughs> is that we accept dual or multiple citizenships throughout the world uh, as a matter of course today. That was not the case in the early 20th century uh, and the late 19th century. Uh, uh, it was seen as one of pretty much every, every legal historian uh, or every legal juridical thinker on citizenship agreed, and, and all states agreed too, that, that more than one, belonging to more than one state was absolutely undesirable, and there are many treaties that ban it, and many attempts to ban it, uh, and that is certainly not the case today. So in a way, it's easier today, because uh, there are more options. Um, it, I mean, you can solve a stateless uh, issue, uh, you can solve issues like that by have, allowing populations to have dual, uh, dual citizenships. Um, but, uh, uh, I mean, the, the examples are quite legion. I mean, after, in the aftermath of World War One. Uh, throughout all of the Eastern Europe, you had populations on, on different sides of the border, and the Habsburg uh, citizenship uh, uh, disappeared, and there were Hungarians and Romanian, and Romanians and Hungary, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and the issues, uh, there were a lot of stateless people that resulted. And the Nancy passport applied after, after the Russians, the next biggest population was Armenians. There were uh, huge numbers of stateless Armenians. Um, so they were under the protection of the League of Nations, right? Under the protection of the League of Nations, right. Uh, so uh, that was the next biggest population. <coughs> but yeah, there's, there's lots of examples. And uh, I'm trying to think. There's, there's a book coming out about those Armenians uh, from the archives of the League of Nations. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. There, there's a book called uh, The Rights of Minorities by the author. Uh, Carol Fink. Carol Fink, The Rights of Minorities. And she deals with the League of Nations uh, attempts to deal with all of these stateless populations. It's a very good, uh, with lots of good sites. So if, if you look at that book, you'll find a whole list of different cases and, and sites of the literature and a good comparative study. If I, could, uh, if I can jump briefly on this, uh, it's interesting that the principle of permanent religions was upheld by many of the principle of Russia broke 
And the population was marked by the state as either belonging to this community or not belonging to this But I think if we have a long-term historical perspective, we will see that uh, this story is very modern and very recent. And many of the populations were de facto stateless in this region because they couldn't even think that they belonged to that state. My favorite category from the history of Russian citizenship is Baradechi Nels, wandering elements. <laughs> it was very difficult to determine their subject here because they migrated. It was Eurasian. Uh, very difficult to guess them uh, as a chapter, a special chapter of wandering elements. So that, that just historically to complicate the picture. More questions, comments, please. Um, uh, the, the entire debate over legal 
limitations put on the ability of foreign citizens to inherit land or to acquire new land. And it was, it was, it was very real. So there, were, uh, there was a large population in Bolivia of, uh, I think it was about, about 200,000 German colonists in Bolivia. They were subject to this law and they were facing decisions about uh, buying more land if they were probably successful or inheriting the land to their children, uh, which they couldn't do under the new regulations. The result is within five years of the passage of this restrictive act, the naturalization, there were 50,000 German colonists out of uh, 200,000 who naturalized within just a few years. So there's one instance where they were clearly doing it to get a benefit. They were, they were doing it to escape from a, 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 a sanction. Um, in uh, the Far East, there are also a series of examples. Um, Koreans were allowed to naturalize uh, under certain circumstances and in certain years, but not all the time. And when, when they were allowed in those certain years, they naturalized in large numbers. Um, Chinese were not allowed to naturalize at all. Basically, almost no Chinese uh, naturalized. It was almost impossible. Even the most successful and prominent uh, Chinese merchants had a hard extremely hard time uh, naturalizing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it was an individual decision in, in each case, I suppose. You have, to, you have to just go through each individual and see, you know, if any, maybe some people did it out of, you know, I love this country and I want to be a citizen. So, I don't know, maybe there are cases like that. But it's crucial that the, indeed the, the subject really would help to detail if we're talking about a person who to nobility. Uh, this is one case. I mean, the one case I know is a, is a deputy of the State Duma who happens to be a Habsburg uh, subject, and then he's elected as the representative. And then, you know, he's an entirely different situation. He's elected as a foreign citizen. I mean, there was a case in Wow. <laughs> uh, not only that, he had an experience in the, in the state uh, in the Habsburg Empire. It was a whole case. But a peasant worker is a whole different story. So the people don't make much sense until we get to the radical flight of uh, citizenship practices of the 20th century, where it's Chinese and Korean, without any further specification of what kind of Chinese and what kind of Korean we're talking about. So that, that flattening of the world is a result of the 20th century. That, that's there was, I mean, it could, it could work the opposite, in the opposite direction, too. The, there was a... Um, a Moscow uh, Merchants Club that was basically, uh, uh, it was the German Merchants Club in Moscow, and uh, it was, the foreigners ran it, and um, there were lots of complaints from the local merchants that so Russian subjects don't have access to this elite club, you know. <laughs> you have to force them to open their doors to, to, to Russian citizens. So, um, it, it's complicated.
term of usage uh, to, to denote the state membership. And uh, so it's kind of curious because citizenship, uh, uh, in the Russian case, the word itself became um, kind of an ideal type almost. Uh, it referred to this ideal of uh, equal rights and obligations in the law. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, it's been conceptually, I think, difficult for people to think of Russian citizenship. Uh, I got, often got the response when I told people I was writing about Russian citizenship, people would say, oh, that existed. There's a, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> a, a basketball buddy of mine and said, what? Well, that's, that's, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, I had to explain that, well, no, state membership is, you, know, you have to have equal rights under the law to be a member of a state, and that's what I'm writing about. Um, so, am I getting towards your sort of question a bit, or? Yeah. And you know, the, the other complicated thing in this, in this story is that I picked the citizenship boundary as the dependent variable, as the focus of the uh, analysis. The whole question of equal rights and obligations under the law, the transition from the Sicilia system towards equal rights and obligations, is, is part of the story, and it's, it's important, but only in the, insofar, for me anyway, as it relates to the questions of citizenship. So, when, um, for example, when an immigrant comes into the country, it's a very real question in the 1860s as to whether, say, it's a businessman or uh, someone in commerce, it's a real, real question what's most important. It, it's, actually, it's not a real question. He goes to the local Kupyatskaya Obshitsva and, and gets a preliminary um, a signature of, of agreement to accept him into the ranks of the Kupyatskaya. And then he takes that to uh, a local office, and it's required that he have it in advance before he can naturalize. So naturalization is the second is the second independent act on admission into a social uh, category. Same for nobles. You would, you would go to a local a noble institution and, and uh, receive a preliminary document of acceptance into the nobility, and then you would go and naturalize. Now, whether it was actually required to naturalize in order to get into these uh, organizations is an open question. I think in some cases it was not, usually, uh, but often it was. And, and so I don't think there was any universal principle that you had to be a citizen in order to be accepted into uh, these local institutions. But it seems to have been, uh, a, there seems to have been a strong enough link in people's minds they felt it was part of something because people regularly did it. And there was this regular procedure where it was a precondition to naturalization that you get this, this acceptance. Um, uh, you get to declare your story uh, of the Jesus, you get to declare it, and uh, in most cases, have a proven acceptance. I actually raised a mental with my dad, so I didn't see it, but I was. A couple, of, uh, couple of, of, of questions. Uh, I think it's a, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great book uh, to appear because it does uh, not only justice to the historical context and the question that people didn't pay attention. Indeed, defining citizenship only as a way of political participation or any more aspect. Uh, but it, it also reminds us of the many questions that we face now. The question of stateless people is not only in Estonia, but in Guantanamo as well. And we can see how the lack of citizenship can be detrimental, even though we criticize citizenship for many of the uh, uh, bad things associated with the filtering and, and you know, belonging uh, uh, to a particular political community. Uh, but I have a couple of, a couple of things to raise. Um, I, one is on the question of the exception. And you even said at the beginning of your presentation that you're trying to see the central narrative in the sea of exceptions, and every part of the story is an exception. Now, I deal with exception and exceptionalism with uh, particularly that chapter of the political representation and that the state do. And I think uh, we have to uh, attend more to the mechanism of exception, making an exception, as an operating medium uh, of the 
uh, of the empire, up to a certain extent, up to a certain extent, up to an extent, the idea of uniformity, decentralization, order becomes a powerful narrative that uh, uh, that is impossible to escape when you are formulating uh, when you are formulating a policy. Uh, and similar to that, and this is this is a comment. You know, I would, and you give an indication of, of several in, in your several cases that the idea of the context in a particular region in which questions of admission to the political community and policing the regulation of the boundary were determined to the logic of that particular space of that particular region. North Caucasus and Caucasus is one story. Far East is another story. The Baltic Blue is is a third story. So it would be interesting, actually, to see whether there is uh, a particular calculation and an impact of the decentralized imperial authority on, on, on some of the questions, the Sargun, uh, other things. And also to think about um, exceptionalism uh, as a way up to the modern of imagination about citizenship in 1914, as a way to actually regulate and create, uh, uh, and create some order uh, some order in, uh, in in the empire. It, it would it would seem to me seem to me from um, uh, from your presentation and an answer to that uh, when you are comparing this story to the European story, you mean European uh, states, <coughs> sovereign territorial states. Uh, whereas of course the whole question would be whether we take the story to India, uh, to Algeria, and uh, Senegal, and, uh, and other questions. So, I mean, there's, uh, there's, um, I'm struggling with this question, but I think this, these exceptions should be not treated as a uh, deviation from the norm, but one of the operating mediums up to a certain extent of the existence of this, um, uh, of this political, uh, of this political regime, very specific political regime that we call for a good reason, uh, an empire. And then I had, um, basically I had one very quick question uh, about Central Asia. This is where you would expect networks of people travel. Uh, the Central Asian expansion is the second half of the 19th century. So that would resemble the story of the Far East, a much more modern concept of the territory, political space, the boundary of the subject, uh, than uh, in the Caucasus the story starts. Uh, oath taking is, is, is very famous, of course, uh, 
are the representative of the term and who they, they don't understand what they're doing. We have mutually different uh, mental worlds in, in terms of what these kind of oaths mean. Uh, they take the oath, but the oath is also administered to uh, leading officials in the headmanets, uh, several thousand of them throughout the realm. Uh, and over time, these, these autonomous separate institutions are whittled away until they're ultimately abolished um, uh, under Catherine uh, completely, and that region is brought into, into the Russian Empire. Um, you see a general sort of process like that in most other cases, but not all, and not entirely. And some more than others. Finland, of course, retains the most autonomy. Has a, the, by, by far, it has the most separate citizenship of any other region in the world. Um, it's, it's harder for a Russian subject from uh, the non finnish areas of the Russian Empire to, uh, to, to naturalize and acquire the rights of Finnish subjecthood than it is for an American or a Brit or a German to move to Finland and acquire Finnish subjecthood. Um, and it's very difficult, and it requires a lot of money. They, uh, I think it was 5,000 rubles or something. It was, it was, it was a really, really uh, uh, high wall, and almost nobody was able to do it. Um, Finnish subjects who moved out of the country, Finnish subjects who moved into the Russian Empire had retained protections from the Finnish uh, government. Um, when the right figures in the Duma were uh, you know, railing against all of the exceptional uh, privileges of Finnish subjects, there was a kernel of truth there. They, they had their own realm. It was, it was a separate subject. Yet. And um, there was a, a real sense of an internal border when you crossed into the Finnish, Finnish uh, territories. But that was really kind of exceptional. I mean, the other, Kiva and Bukhara had their own subject that was technically existed, and you had the documents that showed that you were uh, a subject of the, uh, of the Emirates. They had different policies in terms of uh, regulations on settlements and, um, and then different laws that applied. Um, but the scale of, of, of these different regions within the Russian Empire and their separate subject is their separate deals, their separate laws, their separate rights and obligations. Um, the scale of difference, if you compare it to the Habsburg monarchy, of course, is, is just not comparable. I mean, there you really have separate entities, separate kingdoms, um, and you can grow in there. Well, it's kind of a story, isn't it? And, and it's not just a, an issue of Russia and its neighbors. 
to citizenship is a subject of international law as well. And so the international lawyers have weighed in on this kind of tax, and so they don't agree with it. So that those, those are issues to be dealt with as well. Um, complicated stuff. Um, let me maybe uh, I just say how I conclude the book. I'm going to talk about these things briefly. Um, but the main conclusion, the last sentences in the book, are referring to the shortage of labor in Russia uh, and the large-scale import of guest workers and how uh, projections of studies that have been done looking 20, 30 years into the future uh, all say that Russia is going to have a massive uh, shortage of labor. Uh, there's just no way around that. If, I mean, assuming that Russia, the Russian economy grows, uh, which we all hope, there's going to be a shortage of labor. Where is it going to come from? Um, well, here's the, here's the great dilemma that Russia has faced throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, uh, that great dilemma. Do you uh, open up the country to large-scale immigration uh, as part of your modernizing strategy, or do you do a more autarkic, closed-off form uh, uh, of uh, economic development? And one that pays, do you pay more attention to the potential uh, demographic effects of your citizenship policies, or do you try to bring as, in as much labor as possible? Huge question. Uh, and it's, it's one of the biggest questions Russia, I think, will be facing in the next three, next few decades. So that's it. <laughs> On that note, I uh, welcome everyone to join me to thank Eric for his presentation. Uh, thank you.